Good afternoon and welcome to the provocatively titled Is Telly a Turnoff for Young and New Talent? Uh, we've got a terrific panel and I know that everyone always says that and quite often it isn't true. Uh, but this one genuinely is great. Uh, we've got the controller of BBC Three, Fiona Campbell, uh, chicken shop date legend and cult presenter Amelia de Moldenberg, the head of development for Talent Works at BBC Studios, Helen O'Donnell and... I think I can say this, my favourite from People Just Do Nothing, Asim Chowdhury. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, let's, I think we'll just get the question answered quite quickly. Um, is telly a turn off for new talent? <laughs> it's just yes or no down the line. Fiona? No. Amelia? No, if they commission. No, uh, <laughs> no, no. 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 Yes, but commissioners listen, ah. no. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's so that's that really. I don't know if you want to. Um, we've got fifty minutes. Uh, Can we leave as well? <laughs> I think. I mean, if everyone's happy to, it's sort of quite definitive, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, I think we we should fill. We'll have a chat. We'll have a chat. Because um, whether you look at it just sort of anecdotally, or or if you look at the stats, it is clear that the way that audiences are consuming content is changing very rapidly. So half of UK households. Uh, now have video on demand subscriptions. Uh, UK adults on average uh, watch half an hour of YouTube a day. Uh, and it's also clear that the path to becoming on-screen talent is changing quite a lot. So when I was starting, which admittedly was quite a long time ago, mm. uh, you could maybe film something if your mate's dad had a camcorder, but there's nowhere to put it and it was sort of pointless. Um, equally, it feels like there were more routes in uh, so for me, it was sort of E4 and, and, and T4, and before that, maybe like the Big Breakfast and regional programmes. Um, whereas now, uh, maybe less obvious routes in, but anyone with a phone can upload content and see if it finds an audience. Um, so starting with you, if I can, Fiona, which I can, um, how, do you, uh, how do you work to, because I'm running it and I do what I like, uh, how do you work to identify and nurture new talent these days? There's a lot out there. There's a lot out there. Um, I would say at BBC Three, we have two bases. We have the London team and the Birmingham team, and there's probably about eight to ten of us are constantly looking at development, thinking of ideas, thinking of the next areas of relevance that we talk about that we want to get into. And our in-house development team on that side are constantly coming to me with talent that they've found you know, on YouTube, on Instagram, that they like or in fact that they know um, personally, so that we've got people coming through all the time that way. Uh, Hot Property, we've just done Young Philly's very established on YouTube, and he's going to go into series two of that now on uh -huh. BBC Three. Um, and then on top of that, you know, people, because people have the ability to make their own content and demonstrate their own voice and demonstrate... Um, just their own abilities, either visually or in terms of, say, comedic talent. People send us stuff. Um, I get sent stuff directly or the, the team gets sent stuff. And then on top of that, indies come along having fine people. So there's, there's, there's many ways. Um, and I would say because of social and third party platforms, it, there's just many more entry points that people can say, look, I have an audience. I can bring uh -huh. an audience. People want to engage in a positive way with what I do. And then that gets our attention. Uh, Amelia, do you, can you feel the the hungry gaze of TV execs <laughs> on your every move? Um, yeah, um, <laughs> no, that's a bit intense. Um, no, ki kind of, I guess. I mean, I was have been brought into meetings with different controllers and different channels, like for over the past maybe like three years now, from when I started doing Chicken Shop Date, and I feel like there's a big appetite for channels and controllers and broadcasters to bring digital talent, whether that's just from Instagram or from YouTube, onto the platform um, in a whole variety of ways. Whether that actually ends up happening is is another thing, really. Mm. Uh, there's a great example, obviously, of a, of a very successful transition from online to telly. Uh, let's have a, a look at a clip from an early <laughs> webisode of People Just Do Nothing. This is from 2009, I think, and it's absolute gold. So, hear your voice off camera there. So some stuff changed. Uh, but <laughs> talk us through how you and Corrupt FM went from that to winning a BAFTA, but ideally do it in about 40 seconds. Right. <laughs> um, well, basically, we, um, I finished, I did a film and broadcast degree. So I had my camera, I was doing little shit music videos in car parks. 
And um, right, yeah, off. we just, it, it was based on an original documentary called Tower Block Dreams, which was also on BBC Three. And we were just obsessed with it. And also we used to like all rap and MC and we kind of grew up around that same area. So we just mimicked these characters and we just started uploading it to YouTube. And then um, I think we had a very slow, it's not like, like Amelia, she's got a quite good, you know, she uploads content quite a lot. I think we did three webisodes in around four, three and a half years. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was a real slow burner. Yeah. We had jobs and shit. <laughs> and we were just messing around, we didn't know. But then one of the, um, John Petrie from Rough Cut Productions, Ashitala's company, um, you know, he messaged me on YouTube and we used to get a lot of hate comments because people thought it was real. As you can see, it looks terrible. You made it look even worse. I remember, <laughs> it, being, I remember it being looking better than that. But people thought we were real and they used to go, you job seeking scum and, you know, get a, you know, get a life and all that. So I used to get a lot of hate through the YouTube. And then John Petrie messaged me saying I work for Ashitala. He produced The Office come in for a chat and I was going to be like, fuck off, mate. Yeah. But <laughs> he was like, no, I'm for real, come in. And we went for a chat and then, yeah. It's then, a great slider doors moment there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fuck off, John. Yeah. Done, you're not here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so from, from effectively, obviously, owning the whole creative process and your own timeline, doing it in your own time, um, to it being broadcast on, on the BBC, how much control did you have to give up, do you think? I think, you know, I think it was not really as much of control because we did five webisodes we also did other content and we were already gigging in character. So the mm. world was quite developed already. Um, basically, it was they made it better, really. They helped us write. They helped us understand, you know, sick um, scripting. And, you know, and, and also a lot of the old stuff on YouTube, it's not really available anymore because a lot of it was quite fucked up. It was like, you know, really sexist. <laughs> it was like, but because we were really imitating how these people were in real life. So, you know, they would say sexist comments. They would say homophobic comments. But... Obviously, that's the character, but you can't, that doesn't really fly on a BBC sitcom. Mm -hmm. And also, they just helped us kind of broaden it out to a bigger audience. Because I think, you know, the YouTube stuff, it was like 98% male orientated, you know? So then it kind of opened it up with characters like Mish and they helped us develop it. And I think it was all good. And because uh, there was so much there. And also, we're all, the four, you know, the four of us, the, the creators, we're all such strong minded individuals. I think if they wanted to change it more, we would have been like, well, no, actually, we don't want to do it. So they were, aware of it. I think it helped us, basically. Without yeah. a platform like, like YouTube, is there any chance you think you could have got people just do nothing off the ground? I, I mean, I don't think so. And this was 2009. So it wasn't really, you know, there, were, there wasn't that many viral things going on. YouTube was just seen as a thing that, you know, you're just watching your spare time and it wasn't seen as this platform. So no, I, don't, I think without YouTube, you know, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, I don't know, can you, you can put videos on MySpace, but that's not as really... Wasn't as, it wasn't really a video, it was more... Not going to catch fire, is no, it, really? No, <laughs> um, and, and how much, how many cues were you taking from stuff that you were watching on telly? Because um, you kind of watch it and you feel The Office, you know, that kind of like mockumentary style. Were you fans of The Office and then thought we can do something like that for this world that we know? Yeah, no, definitely. We were like huge fans of The Office. It was like The Office, Partridge, Peep Show, um, Inbetweeners, Brass Eye... Like we all watched that religiously and we used to quote it to each other. But also the real inspiration came from the real people that we grew mm. up around. Like we knew all these characters, we were mates with them. You know, like Chabadi G is like every dodgy geezer you know around the area. Yeah. You know, Grinders, every MC person who thinks he's amazing. Steve's is your fucking local pillhead. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> these characters are real characters. So even though, you know, technically we would use techniques used in comedy and we understood, you know, you know, about pacing and awkward moments and beats and all that kind of stuff. But we had to bring our own world into it, our own West London kind of, or, you know, sincerity to, like, to the show. When you started doing Chicken Shop Day, Amelia, were you taking any, any cues from stuff that you watched on, on telly? I guess um, Pop World was a big mm, inspiration yeah. for me, like Simon Amstel and Makita Oliver, the way that they were able to... Um, were you on that? No, I just did a bit where I was like, here's Pop World. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, <sorry. laughs> yeah. That was my... Listen, I make it sound easy, <laughs> but seriously. Oh, that was my favourite bit. Times. Yeah, yeah. That was my favourite bit. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, Appreciate big, it. Big inspiration for me too. <laughs> um, yeah, like the way that they interacted with celebrities, with musicians, and it was, mm. it was such a like um, fun environment and poked fun at these people that are in some kind of position of power and were asking questions that I think you always wanted to know the answer to, but the straight edged sort of music interviews or just interview formats in general weren't really doing that at the time when I started Chicken Shop Day. 
So I started Chicken Shop Date because there were because I was bored of the regular music interview formats that I'd seen, and I sort of wanted to do something that um, with a, like comedy first. Um, so yeah, I guess Pop World was a big inspiration, and then um, I guess Between Two Ferns, the yeah. that yeah. Kalifanakis and um, comedians in cars getting coffee, the Jerry Seinfeld show, kind of. Um, but yeah, they were like the biggest inspirations to me, I guess.